Hi everyone, welcome. Um, I'm just gonna give everyone a second to get settled and then we'll go ahead and get started in just about a minute. Okay, that's starting to slow down there now, so we might go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome again, and thanks for coming to this month's Evidence Synthesis Ireland webinar. Um, I'm going to hand over most of our time to our speakers, but before I do, I just want to give a little bit of background about who we are. Um, so Evidence Synthesis Ireland is an initiative funded by the Health Research Board and the Research and Development Division of Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. Our primary goal is to support and develop evidence synthesis knowledge, awareness, and capacity on the island of Ireland, and one way that we do that is through these monthly webinars. This is actually our second June webinar, and today we'll be hearing from Dr. Declan Van of the University of Galway, who's also the director of ESI, as well as Professor James Thomas of University College London, and Dr. K.M. Saif or Rahman, also of the University of Galway, about the applications and benefits of studies within a review, or SWARS. They'll also introduce a new funding scheme aimed at supporting research in this area. We will also leave a few minutes at the end of the talk for questions. So if you have any, um, please feel free to drop them into that Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And we'll also record this talk and make it available on our website after the session. Um, I think that's all I have for you for now. Um, so thanks again for being here and I will pass over to you, Declan. Uh, thank you very much, Joanna. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Sounds great. Lovely, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, good uh, evening, everybody. Um, so I'm starting off this talk, talking to you about studies within the review or abbreviated uh, as SWARS. And then we'll be handing over to uh, James and then on to Saif. Just by way of acknowledgement, um, the talk, the slides I'm about to give are based on uh, the following paper. Um, which you can access um, uh, uh, if you wish. Um, and it's just picking out some of the key points of what actually a SWAR is. Um, so systematic reviews, you all know, everyone's on the call, must be conducted with methodological rigor and transparency. Um, and we go to great efforts to make sure that that is the case using best methods or best evidence to inform decisions about how we, we, we uh, 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 answer a clinical question. Um, but equally important is the robust evidence to inform the methodological decisions about how we plan, do, and share the findings of systematic reviews. So systematic reviews are regarded as you know, an important contribution to clinical practice guidelines, for example, and the recommendations that they might arrive from. One part of the evidence that informs clinical practice guideline recommendations. Um, but stepping back a little bit is how do we take decisions about what the optimal ways that we can prioritize research questions, plan our review, um, uh, do our review, share the findings of the review. We need good evidence for that. But we are in a situation where there's many evidence uncertainties exist. So, for example, we still have um, uncertainty regarding what's the what are the optimal approaches to searching and citation screening, and indeed, and I know James is touching on this later. You know that's an evolving field, dramatically so. Um, um, perhaps that calls for some living methodological syntheses uh, around some of these evolving, uh, rapidly evolving uh, processes. Um, so the effect of machine learning in supporting screening and our data extraction. Another uncertainty might be the effectiveness of different modes of sharing the findings of reviews with different audiences. Another example might be look at living systematic reviews, which try to reduce the time between the availability of um, findings uh, and their synthesis. Uh, find the, reduce the time between the availability of the findings of primary research studies and their synthesis, but they need better evidence to inform decisions around, for example, what's team processes, how do teams work together managing workloads, um, integration of the pathways from 
searching and screening through data extraction to updating analysis. I think one good example of why this is important for living systematic reviews is there are far more protocols for living systematic reviews published than there are living systematic reviews because of some of these challenges teams encounter very early on in the process and the recognition of the work that's involved. So um, it, it's likely that many decisions about how reviewers do reviews have not been informed by good quality research evidence. Um, uncertainties exist and will persist unless we bring the same rigor of evaluation of different ways of doing something to review processes. And a resource efficient way of doing that is these evaluations comparing different or alternative approaches. For example, there are other things SWARS can do, um, but it's, it's undertake a study within a review. So use the reviews as vehicles or the team or some ancillary work to embed a primary methodological question. So what is a study within a review or a SWAR? So guided by the methodological uncertainty that they seek to address, a research team um, will conduct a study um, that can help provide evidence to inform decisions about how we plan, do, and share the findings of future reviews. They address methodological uncertainty. They're usually embedded within a systematic review or another evidence synthesis and often can evaluate the effectiveness of alternative ways of delivering or organizing a particular review process. But that's not all, and James is going to go into this in more detail in his session next. They can use uh, diverse study approaches. So a research team can select from diverse approaches, including randomized and non-randomized comparisons, mixed methods, qualitative types, etc., to design a SWAR to explore the implications and consequences of such methodological decisions. So what are the key features of a SWAR? Well, we think that SWAR aims to generate evidence on how we plan, do, and share the findings of systematic reviews or indeed other evidence syntheses. Um, researchers can select from diverse study designs appropriate to the methodological uncertainty the SWAR is trying to answer. They're um, either embedded within a single review or can be embedded across multiple reviews or some of the context outside the reviews. They should not compromise the objective methods, integrity, outcome and dissemination of the host review or reviews within which they are the passenger and the review being the vehicle in many cases. It should be accompanied by its own discrete protocol and we encourage researchers to register the protocols in the SWAR repository or the SWAR store and that's held by the Northern Ireland Network for Trials Methodology Research at QUB and our colleague Mike Clark runs that repository and James will have some examples in that repository in his slide set. Um, a SWAR should, it can inform the methods, design, implementation of future systematic reviews and evidence syntheses. And that's the aim. But where appropriate, the outcome of a SWAR may inform decisions within the host review that is being conducted. And they need not be prohibitively expensive. Indeed, a SWAR is more likely to be more resource efficient than a separate, discrete methodological study because the host for the SWAR, the vehicle, the review itself, um, is already being funded or at least conducted. So some examples of some SWARs, and again, others will be touching on other examples. So does single versus double entitled abstract screening impact the study selection process? What simplified systematic review methods are appropriate to apply in a rapid review? Does it matter for different audiences? How does that impact on rigor? Evaluating the effects of dual independent screening compared with things like, for example, continuous sampling plans or some other modifications of, sample, of a screening. Investigating the effects of including automation techniques when conducting reviews, for example, robot reviewer, automatic extraction of data or AI technology to aid in the literature screening process. Um, we do feel it's important that there are some priority questions for SWARS and some where to perhaps look 
to inform what SWARs have been already been prioritised and need to be conducted is the priority three study, and that identify the top 10 and more rapid review methodology research questions identified using a James Lind Alliance approach. Um, so it, that was an evidence census Ireland project with a large number of collaborators. And um, those questions should act as a, um, a, a repository of prioritised questions that someone might seek to answer. And ideally, we'd have a suite of people gathering around the same priorities. So it's important to register SWARs, as I mentioned. Um, the Northern Ireland Methodology uh, Hub in Queen's University Belfast hosts the SWAR repository. Um, it's a centralised library of these methodologies, methodological studies and a place where people can log their proposed study and deposit their findings. And people can also use the um, SWARs that are there as templates to support them in answering their own SWAR or in contributing additional evidence to a particular SWAR question so that we become more confident in um, answering that question or the evidence base that is answering that question. So the list of registered and ongoing SWARs is available at the SWAR repository and a new SWAR can be registered using a simple form and this promotes transparency and in the same way with a systematic review protocol, it avoids unnecessary duplication of effort. When it comes to sharing uh, SWARs or dissemination of SWARs, ideally they'd be published as a standalone paper. If the SWAR was conducted within a host review, its findings could be published within a section of the host review. Um, but please make sure that you, if you do that, that you note the same in the abstract of the host review. A SWAR addressing the same question uh, can be conducted within multiple host reviews simultaneously. And here, for example, the results from each SWAR could be synthesized collectively and reported simultaneously within one publication. And they're having some examples of that in a sister to the SWARs, which is SWAT, the studies within a trial initiative. Um, regardless, though, we encourage the publication in peer-reviewed open access manners so the findings can better inform decisions on how we plan, do and share the findings of syntheses. Um, we think it's important that uh, linking SWARs with their, so excuse me, linking SWARs with their associated protocols in the SWAR repository. And then we encourage um, dissemination of the findings through diverse channels, um, not just the papers, so webinars, podcasts, conference presentations, blogs, workshops, training, education that you're all involved in. So thank you. And I'm going to hand over to James. And James is going to give me the cue for next slide. Thanks, Declan. Can you hear me now? Yes, yep. James, thank you. Great. OK. Um, OK, so um, the next slide, please. We'll start with the topics. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the various methods that have been used to um, conduct these studies within a review. Um, and so where better to start than looking at the repository that Declan mentioned. And I had a quick little look this morning at, um, at what had been registered so far. And you can see the distribution of topics there quite evenly distributed. There aren't large numbers. This is about 20 something um, protocols registered there at the moment. Um, automation, author contact, efficiency and training are some of the most popular, but you can see data extraction, risk of bias, um, searching reviews of reviews and examining tools for equity are also there. Um, other areas of um, which only have received one, so I didn't put them into the pie chart, were um, dissemination activities um, and PPI activities and, and ways of thinking about um, creating templates for protocols. So there's a wide range of different topics that are covered by um, SWARS, and the um, range of topics is, is reflected by the range of methods. So on the next slide, um, I've got a list of the methods. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Declan? Ah, thank you. Um, 
and you can see I've, I've sort of bolded the top one because that's what we're going to look at first because you randomized trials, cost effectiveness analysis, various types of observational studies, simulation studies and qualitative. So we're going to start off um, thinking about prospective randomized and non-randomized um, experiments within a review. So on the next slide, um, I've got some pictures of um, a couple of publications here, one from the repository, so 14, and another from um, a publication that I was involved in a few years ago. So Declan's mention of open access publications is well taken. I tried to get access to this publication today, and even though I authored it, I can't actually read it today. So there we go, we should go for open access whenever possible. Um, so the, the one on the left, um, evaluating robot reviewer um, for machine learning assisted risk of bias assessments uh, was a prospective randomized trial with all of the um, all of the methodological detail that you'd expect to go with a proper um, randomized trial, um, which took considerable time to set up, um, but the, and it was studies within multiple reviews, if you like, because there were a number of systematic reviews there, um, which were randomized to different conditions. So that was a full scale randomized trial across multiple reviews conducted by someone who actually wasn't involved in those individual reviews themselves. And that compares with another randomized trial on the right there, which is um, smaller scale and it's conducted by people who are doing the reviews themselves. And that's looking um, at comparing different ways of doing data extraction um, for reviewers, as you can see, doing their first systematic review. But in both cases, these are prospective randomized experiments where um, the different interventions being evaluated are randomized. So on the next slide, um, we've got um, a reminder to, that within um, randomized experiments um, and across randomized experiments, we can also carry out these cost effectiveness analysis. Um, so the next slide shows you a screenshot of a publication um, which I was involved in where we compared both machine learning and different search sources for um, identifying studies for a map of um, COVID research. And here we had to think quite carefully in advance, not only about the efficiency um, and the sort of like the metrics on recall that you might expect um, you would need for evaluating um, the sufficiency of a particular um, search source. So Microsoft Academic versus um, Embase and versus PubMed, et cetera. But also we had to think about what data did we need in order to carry out a full cost effectiveness analysis. So again here, whilst we didn't carry out a randomized experiment here, we had to really carefully plan what the comparators were and what the data were that we needed to um, collect in order to conduct a, a sort of a rigorous cost effectiveness analysis. And as Declan said, you, you know, you can have situations where the study within a review actually then informs what happens within the review. So in this case, that exactly did, that was what happened. We used that to decide actually when maintaining this living map, we would shift from using one approach to finding studies to using another because we found it was both more cost effective and actually had higher recall than um, the previous approaches. So the next slide, I think will orientate us again now thinking about observational but prospective observational studies. So ones that will be set up in advance. So on the next slide, um, we've got uh, we've got two, um, an example of a prospective study here, um, which again is looking at um, finding studies, the sources of studies and different ways of identifying eligible studies. And essentially what the uh, authors of this want to look for is, you know, which, which is the best sources to look at? Where, are we, where, we, where do we find um, the most studies that are relevant for our review? And here, whilst you can carry out something like this retrospectively, actually in order to carry out, carry out a study like this properly, and I know because I've been involved in some of these types of study, actually you need to make sure that you're collecting the data in a way which enables you to carry out that kind of analysis. So I've highlighted there that actually, in order to gather the data, actually they have to think quite carefully so that important information about where a particular study came from isn't lost. So it's, this is a nice example of a relatively low cost study, which adds quite a lot of value um, for future reviews, but actually you do have to be quite careful in just making sure that when you're collecting the data, that you carry, you, that you, don't, you sort of don't lose that important information about, in this case, where the studies were found. 
on the next slide, please, Dr. Wim. And here's another example of um, this type of study where what's being evaluated here uh, is a comparison of two different tools for considering equity, diversity, and inclusion in systematic reviews. And here there's the Progress Plus tool um, compared with another tool. So again, the authors were interested in evaluating these two tools within the same review, which gives you quite nice internal validity in terms of a proper comparison. Um, but again, what they needed to do was to set up this comparison um, prospectively in order to um, collect data for both Progress Plus and this Leicester Quality Impact tool, um, and then analyze the results afterwards. So the next slide will orientate us again, I think. Oh, we've got one more on a perspective um, analysis. And this is really interesting because what they're interested in here is not um, looking at something which is, is it this tool or that tool or this source or that source for identifying studies? What they're interested in doing is understanding where all the time goes in systematic reviews. And so prospectively, they've identified using the Clockify application, which is used to record the time spent using particular applications. And so whilst, um, again, this is a relatively low cost study in that the, um, the data can all be collected as just part of doing the systematic review, they've had to think fairly carefully at the beginning about what they want to collect and how they're going to collect the data. And of course, then at the end of this um, review, they'll then have some really quite useful data about which tasks took the longest um, and which task, you know, where, 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 where is most of the time going when they're conducting this type of systematic review. So the next slide um, is taking us into thinking about retrospective observational studies, because of course, when we're doing systematic reviews, we collect and organize an awful lot of data. So on the next slide, um, we've got an example of um, this type of method, which there are many of many of these types of studies. I've just picked this one. Um, and this is where existing review data, resisting screening data, as Dector mentioned, on um, using machine learning for identifying studies can be used. Um, and in this case, what they've done is they've got some, they've got a convenient sample of screening projects that had already been completed at this institution, and they've got the existing screening data. And so they basically fed this information through the Abstraca machine learning tool, and then compared what Abstraca thought with the human reviewers' decisions. So this is a nice example, and there are many of these, where you've got completed screening data, and you can then use that data, you can run it through a machine learning tool to simulate what might have happened if you'd used a machine learning tool, and then compare with human decisions. Um, the, next, um, stud the next slide will show us um, a little bit more. We'll go, we'll go on to the next one, where we um, think about simulation studies, which you can do at scale. So obviously there are there are data sets of um, systematic reviews, Cochrane being one of the biggest and, and highest quality, um, where this study, what happened here was an evaluation of different approaches to um, rapid reviews, essentially for, for identifying studies, which search sources and which approaches to finding studies um, are most efficient and also in really interesting in this study, taking it all the way through to the meta-analysis itself. So what happened here was we um, took two, two and a half thousand Cochrane reviews. Um, we, we simulated the approach of using different um, methods of cutting down the search, essentially, and then followed that through into rerunning the meta-analyses and looking to see what difference it made. And so one of the, the um, the challenges when we're doing systematic reviews and doing SWAS um, on systematic reviews is knowing where the outcomes should be. Um, and, you know, obviously there are lots of um, studies which say, well, we found this study or we lost this study, depending on which um, approach was being evaluated. But very few of them actually go through all the way through into thinking about how that affected the findings. So one of the things that it might be useful to do when we're thinking about building up a knowledge base, uh, an evidence base on SWAS, is how many, how often can we actually go through and say, well, there was this difference in process, but how much did it actually affect the finding of the review? So the next slide, please, Dr. Wim. Finally, we're going to go to qualitative studies and the next slide has got an example and some um, text about qualitative studies. Excellent, thank you. Um, so from the, um, from the web, I, I, I found this um, interesting one on um, 
a mixed methods usability study on user experience. And so here, um, this is a study within and across reviews, which was looking at um, user experience of using software. Um, but then there are also, I've seen other user experience studies and some really interesting studies being done at the moment, asking users about their experiences about using a tool, and also some prospective work going on at the moment on collecting data about how changes in approach, um, and it might be changes in the use of a tool or changing the use of a data extraction tool or a risk of bias tool or you know like one of the equity assessment tools, how that actually changed reviewer perceptions. So how do reviewers' understandings of what they're looking at change as they're going through a review? So. Moving on to my last couple of slides now. Um, AI, an area of great interest, area that I'm very interested in. Um, and recently I looked at the current state of the evidence for using large language models for screening records and systematic reviews. And you can see the little um, scatter plot of sensitivity and specificity there. Um, and you can see quite a wide range of results. There are 11 studies, 10 of them had extractable findings, which I put in there. But what did I find? Well, I had different models, different machine learning models, different language models, different reviews, different domains, um, different um, sizes of reviews, different studies in the reviews. In other words, a very heterogeneous evidence base. So on the next slide, I think it's important that we think prospectively about how we're accumulating knowledge in this space. At the moment, we don't know whether AI in the form of large language models is safe to use. Um, and as things are going, we'll get lots of isolated little examples of where it does or doesn't use work, but it'll actually be quite a long time before we actually find this out. So we need to think about when we're building protocols and we're setting up SWARS that um, whilst a lot of the studies may be really quite small, um, N equals one review, N equals two reviews. Actually, if we do a lot of them, then we'll have something um, which can be synthesized, something which um, can itself be the subject of an evidence synthesis. So for that, we need to start thinking about common methods, common data sets, common outcomes. And of course, publishing the templates in the repository um, will be really useful for, for people in the future to um, look to see how they can build on an existing evidence base. And also something that we're talking about um, is, is publishing templates for methods for answering particular questions in particular ways with a view to prospectively, you know, it's a, it's a sort of form of prospective meta-analysis. So where we want to prospectively build up an evidence base about a specific question, possibly even specific tools, so that we can really understand when and how we should or you should, we shouldn't use something. So to conclude on my last slide, um, SWARS can be prospective and retrospective. Um, we can do them in one review, we can do them across different reviews. Um, and as we can see, they use a wide variety of different methods um, and we need to build knowledge systematically. And what you'll have seen also from those slides there is that not all um, studies within a review are actually called that at the moment. So one of the things that it would be helpful if we started doing, and this goes for me as well, with the reviews that the, the swells that we do that we start labeling them as such and we start uh, we start depositing them in the repository so that we actually are able to when we're wanting to find an evidence base on a particular tool or a particular approach that we know where to look so i think that's that's me done now declan and i'll hand over yes thank you thank you over to you Saif. <laughs> Thanks, Declan. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. So I will describe about the Evidence Synthesis Ireland SOAR award scheme. So as you know, Declan and James have nicely presented what a SOAR is and what is the methodology of SOAR. So I will uh, tell you about our SOAR award scheme program that we are running for last one years and already we have awarded in two phases in the last two calls and this year again we are having a SOAR award scheme and the call is open which will be uh, the submission deadline will be in September. So before uh, explaining about the SOAR award scheme I want to just mention about Evidence Synthesis Ireland in the next slide. So Evidence Synthesis Ireland uh, that hosts Cochrane Ireland as well and our mission is to make evidence synthesis more usable in every aspect that includes better designed, well-conducted, well-reported, more usable, 
uh, for decision makers and more usable within the healthcare policy and clinical practice decision making across the island of Ireland, not only that, and beyond globally. And our aim is to build knowledge, awareness, and capacity in evidence synthesis to strengthen the research training and capacity in evidence synthesis and promote uh, the conduct of high quality evidence synthesis methodology research. So we provide training for strengthening the capacity of the evidence synthesis enthusiast or the public who are interested in conducting systematic reviews and evidence synthesis. And we also do uh, evidence synthesis by ourselves and also conduct the methodological research, including the source. In the next slide, now uh, the sort our scheme that I mentioned earlier. So the call is already open and it uh, is opened in June 2024. And the call will be closed in September 3rd, 2024. And you will get the details of the ESI SOAR award scheme in our website in Evidence Synthesis Ireland. And uh, next, please. Next slide, please, Declan. And I just want to mention about um, our previous SOAR awardees, as uh, James mentioned about different methodologies. So from the example of our previous SOAR awardees, you will get exactly the same thing, that the diverse topics and methodologies that covered uh, the SOARs that we awarded previously. So this is the SOAR award scheme 2023. That was the first SOAR award scheme. And we awarded three SOARs. And if you look at the question, so they actually covered a wide range, uh, including some SOAR on exploring the use of artificial intelligence in systematic review screening. And there are also uh, qualitative research that explored the use of a stakeholder consultation or engagement exercise within the scoping reviews. And uh, another one was on the search strategy building using uh, the text mining uh, frequency war tool like PubriMiner. And in the next slide, I will uh, share the SOAR uh, award winners for 2024. And here again, we got some source that use the automated process of detect extraction, and uh, they compared it will it will be comparing the automated detect extraction versus the human detect extraction, and another source will be exploring uh, the difference between the training and experience in the study selection process. And uh, the last one, uh, it will be exploring the discrepancies between the protocols and the published scoping reviews. So as you can see from these examples of already awarded uh, source from the ESSOR awarded screening, so some are exploring the utilization of the AI tool and methods in different aspects of the methodology or steps in systematic reviews. There are qualitative exploration as well. And, and it ranges based on the topic from Every aspect, starting from the screening or data extraction, could be on risk of bias assessment or dissemination or stakeholder engagement, uh, PPI engagement. So it's, it's a pretty broader range across the theme, across the steps of systematic reviews, and across the methodology. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the ESI SOAR award scheme and in the Evidence Synthesis Ireland website, you will get our flyers and you will get the guidance note where the details aspect of the award application is provided and you will also get the application forms. And there are relevant other sources so that provides our first SOAR methodology paper that Declan showed initially and also the SOAR videos and uh, recorded webinars as well. So you will get all the information in this website page. Next, please. So the scope of this call is, uh, as we are saying that uh, to facilitate the conduct of a SOAR, and this SOAR should address a methodological research question on either the design, conduct, analysis, reporting, or dissemination of a systematic review or even other forms of evidence synthesis that might be scoping review, rapid review, umbrella review, and so on. 
and there should be a current uncertainty and a need to provide the evidence to support alternative ways of delivering or organizing review processes. So uh, we believe in the methodologically perfectly conducted evidence synthesis or systematic reviews. And still there are some uncertainties on different aspects of the methods and which can be resolved through again, methodological studies. And that's why we are encouraging the SWARS and that's why uh, we are providing this award scheme. Next, please. Uh, regarding the number of awards, we will be providing up to four awards this year on, on this scheme. And um, the total number of fine funding will be 6,258 and it includes a 25% overhead. And our duration will be 12 months from the signing date of the contract. And uh, we uh, encourage to maintain the strict timeline for completion of the study. And uh, after within the study, so the ARD will, will be in need of providing two reports. One is an interim report and one is a final report at the end of the project after 12 months. Next, please. Next slide, please. And regarding the applicants, this year we have a very big opportunity for all the applicants because in the previous two award schemes, it was only limited to the lead applicants from the island of Ireland, that means Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. But this year, the lead applicant can be located in any higher education institute in the world. However, there should be a collaboration with researchers currently resident in Republic of Ireland or Northern Ireland, and this is mandatory. And host reviews can be located anywhere in the world as well. And applications from early career researchers are encouraged. And there is, uh, if, if you look at the guidance note, you will see that there is a waiting for uh, the early career researchers and uh, as the lead applicant can be anywhere from the world, so they can collaborate with the researchers or evidence synthesis methodologies or evidence synthesis in the island of Ireland. And even if you feel any sort of difficulty in making any collaboration, you may communicate with evidence synthesis Ireland. So we will explore whether there are suitable counterparts so that uh, you can communicate to each other and can collaborate. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just the application form. In the application form, you actually need to uh, provide um, the criteria as per the guidance note. You need to provide the details of your experience. Uh, and in the next slide, uh, we will show the, uh, the different categories for which the reviewers will assign points for the application. Uh, next slide, please. So, and uh, we need to provide the application form that should be completed and the, each applicant should provide the um, curriculum vitae of the lead applicant and that should be submitted to the uh, mentioned address and all these things are provided in the guidance note. Next slide, please. And the applications will uh, be definitely peer reviewed and the review process um, will be an independent process and the uh, conflict of interest rules will be applied rigorously. And we will request our expert peer reviewers. We will review the applications based on the peer review criteria and they will mark it. And uh, two independent reviewers will actually uh, review all the applications. And we will notify all the applicants regarding the uh, peer review outcome. Uh, even if it is not selected, we will provide uh, the comments um, on methodological aspect from the peer reviewers to the applicants. Next slide, please. And uh, this is what is the assessment criteria that I mentioned earlier. So we will look at the track record of the lead applicant and uh, 
if the applicant is an early career researcher, there will be an additional weighting. And in case of an early career researcher, uh, the mentoring arrangement uh, with uh, experienced researcher or methodologist would be uh, encouraged and it should be a satisfactory uh, mentoring arrangement. The track record of the collaborators in the Republic of Ireland or Northern Ireland or the wider applicant team will also be considered. Then the major part will be the rational and potential impact of the SOAR and the methodological approach of the SOAR. So these are the main assessment criteria with the weighting and percentage mentioned here. And so the application should be completed focusing on all these criteria and uh, every aspect of this criteria should be mentioned explicitly in the application form. Next slide, please. And budget, as I mentioned earlier, so it's, it's kind of a seed funding of 6,250 uh, euro, and uh, it might cover the salary or applicable pension or social insurance cost. Um, there should be running cost, dissemination and knowledge exchange cost, and uh, overhead cost of up to 25%. Next slide, please. And regarding the technical guidance. So actually the members of the Evidence Synthesis Ireland Executive Management Committee or the core team are not eligible to apply or to be a collaborator or on a SOAR award scheme. However, uh, once the applicants are awarded, so the awardees will, um, will have the opportunity to receive any technical guidance from the SOAR method team, from the Evidence Synthesis Ireland core team, if they feel that there is any necessity of any technical guidance on the SOAR or its methods. So I think that's all from the SOAR award scheme of this year. So if you have any questions or any queries, you're welcome to ask. Thank you. Thank you all. I learned so much. Um, I'm just going to wait for everyone to pop back on and then we might take some questions. Declan, you still seem to be. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Hi. Um, Okay, so we've got we've got a good number of questions here. Um, so, sort of grouped into two categories: some about SWARS and some about funding schemes. So we might start with questions about SWARS, if that sounds okay, um, and then move on to talking a bit about the funding. Um, so the first question that we have about running a SWAR is: Does it matter which fields or discipline the host review or the SWAR was conducted in? Site view, flagged that there's a a lot of methodological diversity or and also topic diversity in the focus of the SWARs, but do you feel that there's, is it a priority to conduct SWARs within particular disciplines or does it not matter? What would your thoughts about that be? Say something, I could, yeah. I, I, okay, so yeah, James, yeah. And I, I think, that bearing in mind that by definition a lot of um, swaras are quite small um, we need lots of them but we also need that we need diversity in terms of where we are conducting them so um, if yeah I think the answer to the question is probably yes it does matter if if all we have is an evidence base which talks about I don't know how great a particular approach is for um, doing reviews I don't know preclinical studies um, using a particular tool that doesn't necessarily tell us an awful lot about um, how well that tool might work elsewhere. So I, I would have thought we'd want diversity. And uh, I, would, I would agree entirely with James' point on that. I think it's a great question. I think diversity is important. I think the more examples we have of the effectiveness of, for example, an alternative approach, the more heterogeneity we have in the context that's used. And I think the greater confidence we have that it comes to a point perhaps where actually, you know, we know this works and it's across different contexts. So it's likely it's going to work in almost any context. It'll always be the exception. But I think it's increasing our confidence in the generalizability. Exactly. Maybe. Exactly. Yep. Right. We've also got a question about 
um, running multiple spars in a single review? Is this feasible? Is this something that you've done before? Maybe are there pitfalls there or things that you should watch out for when you're running multiple spars in a single study? Um, I might jump in on that one. I, I think so. So I was kind of focusing on it's a great question. I was focusing more on the use of a single swore across multiple reviews. <laughs> and this is the flip of that multiple swores within a single review. I, I don't see any reasons. So so I haven't done any myself. Um, yeah. um I don't see any reason why you couldn't. So for example, if you're doing a very large review, uh, James on the website can jump in here. If you're doing a very large review. Um, with a large number of included studies, for example, that might be a very good um, vehicle for conducting um, multiple spores across a single review. So I know some reviews, for example, where screening would involve 50, 60, 70,000 citations and include literally hundreds of studies. It would seem reasonable that there can be multiple spores addressing screening, for example, addressing sure. if it's affected the risk of bias. And I think there's, I think it's entirely feasible. Um, 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 and it can be easy to do. Um, can be. James, I, I would say, yeah, it can. It's it's a, often a good, you know. Let's 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 create the, you know and generate the evidence base as quickly as we can. So yeah, um, multiple in the same review, great. So long as one doesn't sort of undermine the validity of another, and also just be aware of capacity. We're, we're currently doing that exact thing where we're just do, just doing two within the same review and right. you know when, when you're juggling lots of balls or spinning lots of plates then adding adding to the number of plates to spin um it, yeah it can sometimes just um just result in just that little bit too much workload even though the benefits might be clear i agree completely with uh declan and james and i think that is definitely possible because the SOAR question might be different on different aspects of a systematic review. One question can be on the screening, one might be on the risk of bias or maybe on dissemination. So as long as the process is transparent, methodological, and uh, so yes, it's obviously possible. And then sort of as a second question from that question, um, do you have recommendations about publication of a, a SWAR or SWARs? Um, should they be published in a single publication, separate publications? Are there pros and cons to presenting those findings together or separately, in your view? It's a great question. I, I think, you know, uh, this, this isn't a question unique to SWARS, of course. The same questions asked about trials, for example, answering clinical right. questions. And I suppose the ideal situation probably is we'd have uh, somewhere to go and there's a living synthesis on these methodological questions and the information is fed in and it's updated. So there's a single source of evidence on methodological uncertainties and that's continuously updated. That's utopia. That unfortunately is not where we are. Uh, um, no more than the clinical trials answering the questions, but it's something we should be aiming for. Um, I think in the interim, I think you will have some people publishing the same swores, answering the same question independently. Um, but I think the ideal would be having, uh, and there are examples of this certainly within the SWAT literature, where mm -hmm. you'd have the same SWARE question answered across multiple reviews, sure. published as one synthesized. By the same research evidence. team. By the, that... by the research team that has been distributed internationally across okay. a suite okay. of reviews coming together, sharing that findings. A little bit like the analogy probably of the independent individual patient data meta-analyses where you have individual trialists all feeding teams and the patients participants who took part all feeding in information and the individual trials then teams come together and pool everything published as a single um, IPD. Yeah I'd only add to that that um when you're thinking about doing evidence synthesis and you've got two studies in the same paper that's that's sometimes a bit of a pain so i, I always say you know don't don't salami slice where not, where you can actually make one coherent paper answering the same question but where you've actually got two different you know maybe you've done screening and then you've done risk of bias assessment i don't advocate for putting them in different publications because if you're thinking about re reuse further down the line it just it just makes that easier Thanks. 
Okay, so we've got um, a couple more questions about Suarez. I might take one more just so that we, in the interest of time, so that we have time to address the funding scheme a little bit more. Um, so Declan, you talked a little bit about isolated SPARs um, and maybe could you talk a little bit about the work that's ongoing to address this phenomenon of the isolated SPAR and to sort of unify our understanding? Um, I, I, I think I, I think the work that's so the work that's needed, uh, let me put it that way, is to, as James suggested, I think in his talk he did uh, around, you know, um, sharing protocols, developing developing protocols on priority questions that teams can come together and collaborate on running those swars across multiple reviews simultaneously working to a shared protocol for which there are agreed methods, including outcomes, et cetera, and then start feeding that information in. Because <clears throat> what we're all here for is to increase the, well, one reason we're all here is to increase the efficiencies of the reviews. They, they do other things, but in terms of, you know, it's going to be a very laborious task. We want to see, like, are there efficiencies that can be introduced or increased rigor, perhaps, with more effort. That might be the case. But we, we can do that by, you know, all... It would be a shame, I think, if we have the research community all tackling diverse questions and actually we're not concentrating on, on really answering prioritised questions. Sure. Because we can get some direction then to inform our decisions about where we go. <clears throat> okay, great. So I might shift us over to talking a little bit about this, the ESI SWAR scheme. Um, so we've got a lot of questions about this idea of the early career researchers. So do we have a definition of what an early career researcher is? Who should consider themselves an early career researcher and how are we deciding? We do have, we do have, and um, I, I just, in general, I want to mention that most of the question regarding the ESI SWAR scheme, you will get every detail in the guidance note and in the application form. And regarding the early career researcher, uh, so actually in the guidance note and in the application form, we have mentioned that we are considering uh, one who is currently a PhD student or within their first five years of academic or other research related employment after completing their postgraduate research training are considered as this early career researcher in this or our scheme. Okay, um, I might, smush a few questions together here and just ask broadly, are there um, sort of exclusion criteria? Are there people who are not eligible for the scheme? Someone's asked particularly about if you're affiliated with the, the Health Research Board, would that be an exclusion? Um, you, might, you might jump in there, if you want. Uh, um, no, Declan, just so, go ahead. Yeah, so, so um, the only people that are excluded currently from the scheme or are the ESI core uh, uh, team. Um, um, and um, the HRB staff wouldn't be excluded because in the funding is one independent of them for this, these schemes, including the peer review process, et cetera. So no, they would not be excluded from the scheme. Okay, great. Um, another question just asking for some clarity around the idea of a lead applicant. Who is considered a lead applicant? I assume this means do you have to be a PI or is there exactly there? exactly so the application um, who will submit the application and who will be named as the principal investigator of the project so is considered as the lead applicant and there can be other collaborators and I also saw one question regarding how to find the collaborators uh, so even if someone is uh, someone gets difficulty in finding the collaboration so maybe they can communicate with ESI so we are not saying that we will provide you the collaborators but we will uh, try to uh, share that information within our network so that if someone is interested might collaborate great okay and, and, and we're taking a very broad approach to what who can be the PI so we have so there's no like you know we welcome PIs from the early career researcher community we um, some PIs across schemes have been very senior, some have been very junior. Um, it's more about the team. Do the team bring the collective expertise that's needed to deliver the piece of work as distinct from the single person with the PI? Submits the application. Exactly. Okay. Yep. exactly. Okay, thanks. Um, 
I guess, again, just to, to sort of answer a question that's coming up a lot, um, are there, and I assume there's more direction about this in the description of the, in the application, but um, are there things that the funds can't be used for? Um, you're nodding, Kathleen. Yes, sorry, sorry. Do you want to jump in or do you want me to jump in? <laughs> so as I, as I mentioned, so uh, the funds uh, can be used for salaries, and including you know the uh, pension and other cost and there is a dissemination cost and it's a very small amount of earning as i mentioned so 6250 so mm, it's suitable as as it fits in with your uh, applicability so but but it it could be it could cover the salaries or dissemination cost or the running cost as well okay the, the, one, the one just one, one thing it doesn't cover which is a difference for example for uk colleagues is um, and other colleagues it will not fund the salaries and associated costs of academic staff who are employed full time. Um, and that's be, that's not unusual to Evans and Ireland. That's in line with many Irish health research funders. And exactly. When, when you say full time, like with that, there were a couple of questions in here about contract staff salaries. So somebody who's working full time, but on a temporary contract, would they fall into so that? So if that's research staff, then that, that, that can be covered. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, also, um, and and uh, um, equipment, uh, laptops can't be covered. But okay. again, Cypher said, can't, cannot. Cypher said, and th but they're the only two restrictions I can think of. But as Cypher said, all of that is also in the guidance document. Yes. So I encourage everybody to visit the website for the guidance details. The takeaway is read yeah. the guidance notes. Absolutely, which yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, just, I know we're coming up on time here, so can I just ask one last question about the application? Um, what do you consider the highest priority areas for this call? Are there um, areas that you're really interested in funding in this call? Right. <laughs> uh, as, as we mentioned that there should be a very strong rationale for conducting the SWER and which methodological uncertainty is it addressing. So that would be most important. So we would not say that there is something we are really very interested in, but as I showed the examples from previous SOAR, so, and as James mentioned, so AI in evidence synthesis uh, might be very much emerging during the methodological aspect, but we are not highlighting that this is our priority. So I will focus on the methodological uncertainty that will be addressed by this SWIR question. So that's so from my perspective. demonstrating a need for the SWAR rather than any particular exactly. area that exactly. the ESI is interested exactly. in. Okay. Okay. Um, we've got loads more questions, but I think we're running up on time. So I might just say we do have a contact form on the ESI website. So if you do have other questions that aren't covered by the guidance notes, okay. uh, you can always reach us on our website and I'll give that URL in just a minute. Um, I have a couple of small housekeeping notes in depth and I know you've got to run right at two. So feel free to kick off. Thank you for being here if you need to. But so first, I've dropped a link to the feedback form for this webinar in the chat. We'll also send this to you by email after the session. Um, as always, I'd really encourage you to have a look at it and fill it out if you can. We really, really do pay attention to this feedback. Um, and especially, we really value any ideas that you have for future sessions. Um, we're taking a break for July and August, but we'll be back on the 19th of September at 11 a.m. Irish time. On that day, we'll speak with Dr. Annie Sinnott, Senior Research Fellow at Monash University, and Alicia Staines, founder of the Maternity Consumer Network. They'll deliver a webinar on lived experience in living guidelines, recruiting for diversity, where they'll describe how they designed, recruited, and supported a consumer experience engagement approach for the living evidence for Australian pregnancy and postnatal care guidelines. So if you're interested in joining us for that session, please follow the link that I am about to drop into the chat. Um, this is also on our website at www.evidencesynthesisireland.ie. You can also find information about our other trainings as well as recordings of past sessions and information about funding schemes um, on our website as well. Finally, if you're interested in keeping up with all our news and events, you can also give us a follow on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Um, but for now, I think that's all I've got. So thank you again for joining us. I hope to see you again soon. And thanks to you all for the discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone.